guess a lot of people out there keep expecting this team to lose. And guess what? We're only going to have one more chance. And uh, then after Saturday night, you got to say they earned it. My goodness, we're going to run out of excuses. We got Melissa Trebowasser on the line. Talk TCU taking on Kansas State in the Big 12 Championship. Hey, Melissa, how you doing? I, you know, I can't complain. I just watched TCU finish a 12-0 and regular season, get to play for a Big 12 Championship this weekend. And for the first time ever, they are firmly in control of their own destiny when it comes to the college football playoffs. It's a pretty, pretty great position to be in. Did you actually tell me before we started to record that uh, some of the TCU players said that their best game is still in them? And, and I saw 62-14. And I, I, I know Iowa State's not that great, but they don't lose to anybody 62-14. No, it's it's the most points that that program has given up since they lost 55-3 to to TCU back in 2014. So as we continue the narrative of TCU is getting to redo everything that went wrong in 2014. Um, and it's the most points that Matt Campbell has ever given up as a head coach. So I, I think they'd only given up 40 or more like once or twice in his career in Ames and never touch 60. So even if you take away the two defensive scores, still more points than a Matt Campbell uh, defense has ever allowed. I am but, guessing that you would take two more pick sixes on Saturday. That would work. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what's been really impressive is that, is that every week TCU has found a different way to win, it feels like. So, you know, they relied on the defense down in Texas. They use special teams in a miraculous play in Waco. And then they come back and they get the, the defensive scores, which we've been waiting for all season. And then offense, it was like a well-oiled machine. They had a great game plan. They put a lot of really intriguing things on film. Like you said, these guys still don't feel like they've played their best football yet. And to be 12-0, and to have won the way that they've won, to finish with 62-14 in the regular season finale and still to feel like, hey, we haven't really put this all together yet. Sonny Dykes is like living a charmed existence right now, to say the least. Well, he can uh, just about one year after signing his initial contract with TCU could be signing, yes, uh, another charmed existence and extending that after a tremendous season so uh of course tcu knows a good thing when they have it and and want to keep him in the fold well you know it, it's funny there were some rumors going around twitter um nothing verified that the the auburn athletic director liked sunny dykes now they quickly changed course and hired hugh freeze so good luck with that war eagle um but i, I think that just knowing that there's going to be some other options that when you go 12 and 0 in year one you have the kind of turnaround that sunny dykes has had obviously people are going to come calling I think he's pretty happy to be coaching Power 5 football in the state of Texas. I think he's pretty happy to be at a place like TCU where there are un unlimited resources, obviously, to win at a high level. And I don't think he minds not having to deal with the drama that you might get in, say, College Station or Austin. But, yeah, I think Jeremiah Donati has been shown that he's being he's willing to be proactive. And when he's got something good going, he's going to lock it in. So Sonny Dykes wasn't hurting and the, uh, the annual salary payment, to say the least, before this. But they'll throw a little bit more, uh, you know, shillings his way and, and probably bump up his assistant coaching salary because that's what you really got to watch. Joe Gillespie and Garrett Riley are already showing up on, on coaching hot lists here with so many jobs opening up. So I think that's going to be the key is can you keep this thing running with the same assistance in place if Sonny decides he does want to be in it for the long haul? Well, playing off of your War Eagle comment, we were talking Auburn a little bit earlier, and I got to say that, uh, you know, Hugh Freeze may go down there and tear it up, but look at the track record. He's had one successful run. That was at Ole Miss, and we know what led to that successful run. So if you cheated to win the, the one time, yeah. I don't understand the hire necessarily. I would think that there would be better options. Well, TCU is in a good place with Sonny Dykes, definitely a class act and getting yeah. the job done on the field as yeah. well. All right. We saw TCU Kansas State. I watched that complete game. Uh, it's been a while. It's been mid-October, I would guess. Uh, that game was a game in which TCU detractors would say Adrian Martinez gets hurt in the first series. Will Howard comes in. He plays well. He gets hurt down the stretch of that game. 28-10 at one point, K-State. TCU comes back and wins it. So how much has this team changed since that game against the Wildcats? I mean, I think you're looking at two very different teams. Um, you know, Adrian Martinez came into the game a little bit banged up, took himself out, wasn't on a hit or anything. He had a deep thigh bruise. And I think if you're a Kansas State fan, like if you're in a, in a moment of truth, you're probably saying, man, that might be the best thing that happened to this team because they've looked like a completely different program with Will Howard, who's looked like a completely different quarterback than he has in the past. I mean, he's playing in an offense that's 
really suited towards his success, and he's been exceptional. Uh, when he came in against TCU, he absolutely lit the Horned Frogs up until he got hurt as well. By that point, TCU had kind of taken momentum. It would have been great to see, you know, full strength on both sides going down the stretch, but uh, you know, TCU fans aren't complaining with the win, that's for sure. So um, I think that it, it's going to be interesting to see how different this matchup looks. Um, you're going to be preparing for Will Howard. That's the quarterback you're going to face. That's going to change the defense. The adjustments that TCU made in the second half are really effective even before Will Howard went out. But then you also have a TCU, especially on the defensive side, that's playing a lot more cohesive. It seems to have a much better understanding of what Joe Gillespie is trying to do. Uh, they returned 82% of their production and their three new starters were all transfers. So every single person that plays a meaningful role is learning a completely new offensive de or defensive system for Joe Gillespie. And it's taken until about the last three or four weeks for them to finally kind of get the terminology to start being able to play fast, to play instinctively. There was so much thinking in the three, three, five early for these guys. They're playing a lot more loose and free. And I think kind of, we saw the culmination of that down in Austin when they held the Texas team to three offensive points that super talented Texas team. And then again, you know, against Iowa state, which is, arguably the least efficient offense that they've played this season. Maybe Colorado might be slightly worse, um, but they, I mean, absolutely put the clamps down and didn't let, you know, Hunter Deckers or, or uh, Xavier Hutchinson, anybody on that offense get going at all. And it was a very dominant performance from, you know, really from the opening kickoff. Yeah, you beat me to it, but uh, yeah, I was going to pin you down on what happened at Austin because I wasn't surprised with the win, but the the nature of the game, it just seemed like both defensive lines were just like running through Swiss cheese up front, get, getting to the quarterback, and especially on the TCU side. Uh, and I was expecting, you know, a shootout, and uh, TCU's defense just really showed up, and obviously there's been a difference, and you just gave us a good key on why. Yeah, well, and, and the irony of TCU going down to Austin and using a vintage Gary Patterson-esque level defensive performance to beat the Longhorns who happened to have Gary Patterson on the defensive sideline. It was, uh, this, this whole season has felt like uh, just a giant catharsis, right? Mm -hmm. Like a redemption season. You know, you go into to Waco and you win on a last second field goal after losing on a last second field goal in 2014. You know, you finish the season with Iowa State and, you know, that team in 2014 took a knee inside the 20 yard line. Sonny Dykes was running two point conversions at the end of the first half when he was up by 30 something points. I mean, it, it's everything that went wrong six years ago or eight years ago. Now seems like they're trying to rectify those wrongs this season. And, and so it's, it's been really kind of that kind of storyline that's running parallel to what's happening on the field. has been really interesting for TCU fans and it's starting to ease and salve some of the wounds from, from that 2014 uh, disappointment. With the last two Caleb Williams performances, he seems to have separated himself against uh, UCLA and Notre Dame. However, the list of Heisman candidates that I was looking at, you know, two weeks ago seemed to be like, which way would I go? I don't know. But yeah, there seems to be separation. However, it's a tremendous honor to receive that invite to New York City. And Max Duggan has earned that. We're, we're still waiting word, but he's earned yeah. it. Uh, I think at this point, if Max Duggan is not in the like in as one of the honorees in in uh, New York City in a week, two weeks, uh, what are we even doing here? Um, you know, maybe his numbers don't pop off the page like Caleb Williams do. He's he's not he doesn't get the the advantage of playing Pac-12 teams every week. Um, so no offense to the Pac-12, love them, but. I think we all know. Um, and, and what he's done, not just from a statistical perspective. I mean, this is a kid that's thrown three interceptions this season. You know, he's up over 30 total touchdowns. You know, he's he's moving into every meaningful category statistically for TCU quarterbacks. Um, and just – the, the picture that's going, the enduring picture that that I went, this kid is going to New York was that final drive down in Waco, or second to last drive down in Waco is leading this team down to get the, the touchdown that's going to put him in a position to tie it with a two point conversion. They ended up not getting, and the, his blood is just dripping out of his hand. His, ta his towels covered in blood. His pants are covered in blood. He is literally limping to the finish line um, and, and just willing his team to win. And with what he overcame um, with his heart procedure that, that we thought might end his career, playing three years in a system that was not suited towards his skills and, and just being maligned nationally. When Jalen Rager was going to the NFL draft the, the year that Max was a freshman quarterback, the analyst said that, that Rager had the worst quarterback experience of any wide receiver in, at the combine. I, I mean, nobody believed in Max Duggan. 
but Max Duggan never stopped believing in Max Duggan. And even when he lost the starting job this off season, he prepared and was ready to play so that when that opportunity came, you know, he Wally pipped Chandler Morris and, and never gave it up. And so um, when you look at just the whole embodiment of not only what he's done on the field, not only who he is as a quarterback, who he is as a leader, uh, Max Duggan is one of the greatest stories in college football this season. And, and one of the most deserving candidates that we have to do it, not just from a statistical standpoint, but from an overall human being standpoint, he, he deserves to be in New York city. And I think TCU fans may well riot if he doesn't get the opportunity to be there. Folks, we got Melissa Trebowasser here. Uh, you can catch her on frogs today and catch her there on Twitter. You see the handle right there, the coach Melissa. So catch her on Twitter and track TCU through the big 12 championship game. And, most likely onto the playoff. And I'm going to take us there. You brought up 2014 a few times and I would hesitate bringing this up, but I'm sure you've already processed this a million times. So I've got nothing on you here. Uh, if there's a loss in the big 12 championship game, then the number one comparison is going to be between TCU and Ohio state. Ohio state. There are certain people that are going to say, and we just had a call in show and a number of people said, I would go TCU not even looking at resumes, they made a conference championship game. They've got an extra data point. I would go in that direction. Some people made that claim. Other people said it's more just, hey, resume comparison. Let's break it down. You got 12 and one, 11 and one. Let's look at it. So. Listen, I, I told somebody earlier tonight that if it were to come down to that, you may as well just like open the earth in Fort Worth, like just go kind of upside down. It's going to suck all of the TC fans in because I don't think we can do it. The, the rending of garments, the gnashing of teeth, it, it'll be too much. It'll be too much for us. We can't take it. It, it would be so unfair. Um, heading into Saturday morning, I would have told you that if TCU did not go 13 and 0, there was a 0% chance of them making the playoffs. Like it had to be undefeated after the chaos of Saturday and not just Ohio state losing, but the way that they lost without Blake Corum on the field for Michigan. I think you give the frogs just a little bit better of a chance to get in. Um, I think if you compare the blind resumes, TCU is far and away better. I mean, Ohio State, what's their signature win? You know, what's the game that they've won that you look and go, that was impressive. TCU is going to, you know, be be hurt by the bias against the Big 12. Uh, but when you look at the the strength of record, the, the opportunities for a team with that schedule to go 12-0 and were so minimal. Uh, I think it was like a 2 or 3% chance that, that any team would go undefeated against that schedule. They'll have five ranked wins. Um, they have potential, obviously, for six on Saturday. Um, they've done it with offense. They've done it with defense. They've done it with special teams. And so I do think they would still be worthy of inclusion in the college football playoffs. That being said, I don't trust this committee farther than I can throw them. And I would be – if TCU is not on top of the scoreboard at the end of that game against Kansas State Saturday afternoon – then I will have zero expectation of them being one of the final four, despite the fact that I think myself and most people around college football believe that they should be included. Um, you've got Ohio State sitting out there, and unfortunately, you've still got Alabama lurking around too. Don't give up on them quite yet. Um, and, and I just think that we saw that national brand, lack of a national brand for TCU, quote unquote, hurt them in 2014. I, I think that, that they, they will find a reason to not believe in TCU once again in 2022 if the opportunity presents itself. Mm. So would there, well, obviously the, the scoreboard, when you talk about pointing to the scoreboard, not just a loss, but the, the larger that loss could possibly be, which nobody anticipates Kansas State blowing out TCU, but obviously then the, the odds will start to dwindle from there as sure. well. So. Well, and you, you've got you've got people like Paul Feinbaum and, and Stephen A. Smith saying that a 13 and 0 TCU Big 12 champion wouldn't deserve to be at the playoffs. And, you know, like that, these are these are people get try not to get worked up about it, say it shouldn't matter. But when you have these big national voices who probably haven't watched a lot of TCU football, you know, maligning them and saying they're not good enough, it does it does hurt. You know, it's, it's tampering with the jury, you know, it's, it's, it's getting, it's getting the wrong information out there. So uh, I, I think, and, and that's, that's the best thing to come out of this, you know, is, is that, like I said, TC is sitting in this position. They're going to be probably number three going into the weekend and Sunny Dice can still sit there and look his team in the eye without irony, say, nobody believes in you guys because it's still time and time again, been proven to be true. So, but it, it has been fun to see college football fans around the country that aren't in uh, fans of teams that are on the, that bubble kind of take up the mantle for TCU and, and say, you know, Hey, we've watched this team play. This team is fun. This is good for college football. We'd love to see them be a part of the playoffs. And I think even most of the big 12 is kind of 
rooting for TCU at that this point, which is very, very weird. Well, I may have seen the same conversation that you saw. And Stephen A. Smith obviously knows nothing about college football. And then Paul Feinbaum makes a comment that, and this was after Kansas State had clinched the other spot, and makes a comment like TCU's playing, uh, I don't remember who it is. Uh, it might be like Texas or Kansas State. I don't even remember because nobody's going to watch that game. And I'm like, really? You are a college football guy, and you're dismissing any conference champion. Like, you should be on top of the sport. Oh, and, and by the way, that conference championship game is aired on ABC and College Game Day is broadcasting and ESPN property is broadcasting from that game. So I know Paul Feinbaum spends a lot of time carrying water for the SEC. I get it. He makes a lot of money doing it. I understand. But man, I just like I just wish that people would put respect on the Big 12's name again. Kansas State's a really good football team. There are pros on both sides of the ball for that program. Uh, that That is a, a great team. Deuce Vaughn, if you aren't watching him, you're missing out as a college football fan. You know, uh, I, I'm not going to try to say his last name, but Felix, you know, that guy yeah. on the defensive yeah. line, that, that dude's going to be, you know, drafted in the top two rounds. He's going to be an impactful professional football player. Um, TC's just a lot of fun. Like, how do you love college sports, college football, and not love watching TCU unless you're playing against them? Max Duggan's a great story. Quentin Johnson's probably a first-round wide receiver. Kendra Miller's going to be a guy that's going to get a lot of touches in the NFL. You've got defensive defensive players. Josh Newton, uh, you know, his Carter, um, Carter Boy series on ESPN+. Plus. That dude gives speeches that you will run through a brick wall. I mean, everyone was fired up about Cadillac Williams' speech the other day, and it was awesome. Josh Newton is doing that literally every single week for TCU as a player. Uh, Sonny Dykes, like you said, is a total class act. One of the, the nicest, most likable guys in the sport. Uh, I really do believe that, I, I don't want to be naive, but I really do believe that, that TC was trying to do things the right way down there. And I think Sonny Dykes runs runs a, a program that truly cares about his players. Um, so, you know, I just, it, it's a great story. Like, why not TC? Everybody loved us the Rose Bowl year. We were a ton of fun. We wouldn't shock the world. It'd be really fun to see it happen again this year. Great stuff, as always, from Melissa Trebowasser. You can catch her work on Frogs Today. You see the Twitter handle right there. Melissa, we appreciate you stopping by. Enjoy the Big 12 championship game. So let's get one more and take the decision away from the committee and make it nothing but a choice. There it is.